Welcome back to another uncut video. In this one, we're going to be covering a topic I've talked about before on this channel, red team, and you know how it's different than pen testing, and what does a red team actually do. I think this will be very valuable for beginners out there, and also for you junior pen testers that might not be entirely sure of you know, where red team fits in and what they do. So... I'm going to just kind of walk through this room with you guys uh, for the first time. And, uh, yeah, we'll we'll explore it together. So, yeah, not much really on this first one here. It's just giving you an overview. We're going to learn about the basics of red team engagements, identify the main components and stakeholders involved in a red team engagement, and understand the differences between the different engagements out there. So the first thing that we will cover is vulnerability assessments. So if you if you weren't familiar, this is the most simplistic form of a security assessment, basically. And uh, that's like when you have automated scans and stuff like that. So maybe you have like an agent running on the machine that's going to scan for known vulnerabilities or uh, maybe a dynamic uh, scan or a static code scan, right? Those are all what are known as vulnerability assessments. And there's a lot of limitations with them. I mean, yeah, it's great because you're, it allows you to scan pretty much all the hosts. So the advantage of this is, you know, it doesn't require manpower. You, you could, ha it's all automated, right? So, I mean, maybe you, it requires someone to uh, press a button, but usually these are, you can set these up completely automated to run on a schedule and stuff like that. Sometimes they'll, the annoying part is, uh, sometimes they'll have failures and that, that, uh, people will have to go back and troubleshoot, but for the most part, they're pretty automated. Now, the disadvantage to that is you're, it's not actually exploiting or compromising anything. It's just identifying, the vulnerabilities it finds based on some criteria. And so what that means is that you tend to get a lot of false positives with these. So that means it flags it as a vulnerability, but you know, is it actually exploitable? Maybe yes, maybe no. So it, it doesn't cover that. And you know, in a lot of situations, there's other mechanisms in place to prevent that vulnerability from being exploitable. Now I will say they are intentionally they intentionally err on the side of more false positives because they would rather, you know, have the issue reported and and at least be able to look at it rather than the other, the other case of, of which would be a false negative, and that's where, you know, there's an issue and it was never reported. That's obviously a lot worse. So intentionally, these contain a lot of false positives, but. The, oh, and also by the way, these will do nothing to detect uh, logic based vulnerabilities it's only going to be um you know injections and and stuff like that right and misconfigurations and and all that kind of stuff it, it's not good at detecting logic vulnerabilities so that's where you know these deficiencies are where pen tests come in penetration tests and this is what a lot of people you know the watches channel are probably most familiar with where you know you you have your pen testers which are you know people that are manually conducting these assessments and in these now we are actually exploiting the vulnerabilities that are found on each system and sometimes you'll have like a hybrid approach here of like um this is what i did when i was a junior pen tester there were vulnerability assessments that we would run and and troubleshoot if they failed and then what we would do is take all the findings and manually validate just those findings to make sure they weren't false positives, that they were real issues. So you might be doing a kind of hybrid approach of the first two, especially if you're a junior pen tester. But once you become more experienced, you're going to be doing a lot more pen tests where you know, you're attempting to exploit, you know, you basically have a scope and you have free reign to go at everything um, yourself. So that is the next step in all of this. But one thing they explain, you know, we also conduct post exploitation, right? To see if we can extract any useful information that we can use to pivot. You know, that may or may not be in scope depending on your particular assessment that you're working on. 
but there are some limitations with even this model, right? And that is where red team comes into play, right? So in the real world, we're often talking about advanced persistent threats. And these are typically like nation states and like really highly skilled, a, a highly skilled group of attackers. A lot of times these are nation state sponsored or otherwise. So they have obviously way more time available to them than a pen tester that has to jump from one engagement to another engagement, maybe have a window of like five days or something like that. Right. And you know, the purpose of a pen test is to test for as many, find as many vulnerabilities as possible in the technology. Basically we're testing the technology mainly. Now what it doesn't cover is it doesn't test the response how good is the blue team how good how well does your organization respond in the event of an actual breach right so it we don't test that at all at all as pen testers that is where red teaming will come into play to test for those things right as well one thing they mentioned is that pen testers typically don't care about being noisy or anything like that i think they'll talk i think um, they'll talk about that later probably because um, that is one key difference as well. The, the red teamers are going to need to emulate real attackers, so they're going to have to be stealthy. With pen testers, usually you're contracted out to do the work, um, so you're on a very limited time frame at that as well, so you'll be really noisy because you need to be. Whereas a lot of times these red team engagements are given a lot more time uh, than a a pen test assessment, right? So, oh yeah, here, right here. I thought I saw that. So penetration tests are allowed. So basically everything I just said there and non-technical attack vectors might be overlooked as well. That's another limitation of your traditional pen testing, right? Uh, for example, usually social engineering is out of scope or any kind of physical intrusion. It's out of scope. It's not being tested, um, and then sometimes they might relax the security mechanisms. So, um, disabling or downgrading some like IDS or WA or WAF, right? Because again, uh, you're on a time constraint and they want to get the max value they can out of that limited time. So that's why, of course, okay, here we go. Talking about, um, advanced persistent threat actors, but I was just going to say, of course, for, um, an advanced persistent threat actor, they have as much time as they need, and they won't, obviously, they have to deal with the full, uh, fully hardened environment, right? So, uh, yeah, let's go into the questions here. Would vulnerability assessments prepare us to detect a real attacker on our networks, uh, yay or nay? So, nay to that, it would not, because that's not the point of vulnerability assessment, right? We're just trying to scan as many hosts as possible, identify as many potential issues as we can. And during a penetration test, you are concerned with being detected by the client. So we just said no to that because we just want to find as many vulnerabilities as possible again uh, with a penetration test. So highly organized groups of skilled attackers are nowadays referred to as advanced persistent threats. Maybe I can save myself time from typing that. Let's see. Cool. So now onwards to the actual engagements. So let's see here. Keep up with emerging threats. Red team engagements were designed to shift the focus from, yeah, like I said, basically all the deficiencies I just mentioned, that is why red team exists. It's testing a different thing is what you need to understand. Fundamentally, it's more focused on the, on the process, on the blue team, the peoples and processes rather than the technology. And typically red teamers have larger scopes um, than a lot of the pen test assessments you'll get. So usually the scope is pretty much anything except for, I don't know, there might be a few, I'm sure there's always like a few, things that are off limits in the rules of engagements. It really depends on what you're trying to emulate, and things like that, right? So every red team engagement will start by defining the clear goals, often referenced as crown jewels or flags, ranging from compromising 
a given critical host to stealing sensitive information from the target. So yeah, here's another important thing to note. Typically, you, you're not going to inform the blue team of any of the exercises beforehand because you don't want any biases in their analysis because remember, we're trying to test how good is our response and detection and all that, right? And so the only way to organically assess that is to not inform them of what the engagement's going to be on or anything about it. So they're going to have to just go about their, their day as they normally would patrolling the skies and making sure that there's nothing involved there. Oh, I had a timer on my other uh, machine earlier from some work I was doing earlier, but yeah, don't worry about that. But um, yeah, so uh, you guys, actually, you guys probably didn't even hear it because I just thought I don't even, I'm not even recording my desktop audio at the moment. So that should be fine. Yeah, so this is basically what it what it's going to look like, right? You're going to be using phishing or whatever to gain, gain initial access, typically, right? If this is like a full-on red team engagement, you're going to start as an outside user, and you're going to have to get initial access into, into the environment, right? Typically, uh, the phishing is the way that that is done. Uh, if you're talking about advanced persistent threats, sometimes it might be through ransomware, or malware or something like that, right? That uh, you can entice them into clicking on somehow, but that's always almost always done by with phishing, right? What the payload they actually drop on in their machine to get that access might be different, though. Like I said, it could be ransomware, it could be um, you know just some um, executable somewhere, right? Um. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of times ransomware is just to get paid, right, for them to get money. So, but sometimes you do see, like, um, Trojan kind of uh, malware as well packaged with that. So, yeah, there's a lot of ways they can do it, but basically it's typically going to involve some kind of social engineering. And once they do that, once they're in, that's where, um, and even even from the point they're sending emails is the point that the blue team can start, you know, trying to detect some of this stuff. But especially when they're moving around, pivoting around the network, that's going to generate traffic on the logs. So anytime you perform any action as a red team or even a pen tester, right, that is traceable via the logs if proper logging is in place. But there's so much info in those logs that, you know, you can blend in as a red teamer. And that is ultimately your job is to try and blend in as best as possible with the normal traffic. Just know that any action you take on the network is potentially traceable, but it's all about blending in. So, right. So technical infrastructure, social engineering, physical intrusion as well could be in scope. Just depending on your engagement. And so there's a few different types of ways you can run these exercises. So you can do the full engagement, like I said, where, you start outside with no access and you gain initial access, right? Fishing always works. Uh, let's be honest. If, if you fish enough people, you'll always get at least one person. It always works, right? Another way that you can conduct these assessments, and I think that a lot of smart companies are really starting to, to incorporate this into their scenarios is that of assumed breach. And what that means is that you already gain initial access. Like they give you credentials. You don't have to fish your way in or anything like that. And because here's the reality, right? It's like, like I said, fishing is always going to work. It's just a matter of, you know, how long does it take? And if you're trying to get the maximum value you can out of your red teamers, you know, perhaps you're better served to do an assumed breach scenario. That way the the red team can spend more time on actually conducting the engagement, you know, with the blue team involved things they could possibly detect, you know, and spend less time trying to conduct a campaign, a phishing campaign, and gain initial access, which we all know they're going to get in anyways. Right. So it's just, it could be seen as a more efficient use of their time. So that, that is one option available. There's also tabletop exercises, which would be like an over, they say an over the table simulation where scenarios are discussed between red and blue teams to evaluate how they would theoretically respond to certain threats. Ideal for situations where doing live simulations might be complicated. 
Now, there's also something that they don't talk about here. Maybe they kind of blend that in with tabletop. Is that of purple teaming? It's something you'll hear about a lot. It's where basically kind of like what they're describing there where the red and the blue team come together and they test scenarios where a red teamer will perform some kind of action and then, you know, be in constant, you know, correlation, you know, correspondence with the, uh, with the blue teamer and say, Hey, did you detect that? I just ran this attack. Were you able to detect that? And then maybe the blue team adjusts something on their end and they're like, okay, run it again. And then, okay, yeah, I was able to detect that. And so they're basically working in tandem in order to strengthen the, um, the defenses, basically the detection and response. So, all right, for the questions here, the goals of the red team will often be referred to as flags or I think they said uh, crown jewels. Where was that? Right here. So we'll go with that. During a red team engagement, common methods used by attackers are emulated against the target. Such methods are usually called TTPs. What does TTP stand for? So that would be the uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. The main objective of a red team is to detect as many vulnerabilities in as many hosts as possible, yay or nay. That is also nay because they just need to find one way in. That's another key difference I didn't mention earlier. I, they probably mentioned it. I'm sure they mentioned it here. But they do have a different objective. So the objective will be defined at the, at the beginning or before the engagement even starts. That's something we'll probably see up ahead, I would think, when we get into um, one of these ones here. But basically they will have a clear goal, a singular goal they're trying to do. So, for example, um, I don't know, if it's like a company that's can, that's that has personal information on someone, like a medical company, let's say, right, maybe they have an objective of obtain health records for um, you know, and all the medical records of people registered on you know, on the site or whatever, right? So that, that might be their, their goal. So that's their singular objective. So in that way, they're, they're just trying to achieve that goal. They're not trying to identify as many vulnerabilities in as many hosts as possible. That's more for the pen testers and vulnerability assess assessors. Now, also, I'm speaking of these as separate entities like the red teamers and penetration testers, but just know that a lot of times, on teams, um, they they do both, right? So currently, the team I work on, uh, we have a bunch of pen testers, but some of those pen testers also participate in the red team engagements, right? So all the red teamers are doing pen testing as well. Now, that may differ between organizations. There might be people that only do red team for a particular organization. I know for sure uh, those companies like um, KPMG, EY, all that, like those contract companies, they have like dedicated red teams that only do red teaming. So keep that in mind as well. But yeah, your mileage may vary depending on your company, right? So teams and functions of an engagement. So they outline a red cell, blue cell, white cell. So red cell is like, you know, the the red team and all that, right? The assistant lead, the operators, Blue cell are your blue teamers, your defenders, management as well. And then a white cell, which acts as a, a referee between the two and um, a trusted agent even. So uh, let's see. Serves as a referee between the two, right? So it controls the engagement environment network, monitors adherence to the rules of engagement. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, rules of engagement and then can coordinate the activities between the two to achieve desired goals. And so, yeah, the red team is going to have a red team lead, and that's the person that um, is charged with planning and organizing the engagements at a high level, and then also delegating uh, the assistant lead and operators in the assignments. So then, you know, there's that assistant lead, and their responsibility is to oversee the engagement operations and operators and also assist in writing the engagement plans and documentation if needed and lastly you have the red team operators which is everyone else and those are the people that are executing on their delegated tasks uh, and then interpreting and analyzing the plans from the team leads so 
on to the questions. What cell is responsible for the offensive operations of an engagement? That would be the red cell. And then the what cell is the trusted agent considered part of? And that would be the white cell. And then into the structure, here's where things get really interesting, right? So the core function of, uh, of a red team is adversary emulation. While it's not mandatory, it's commonly used to assess what a real adversary would do in an environment using their tools and methodologies. I think this is really important to note is that most of the time in a red team engagement, uh, in addition to having that clear goal, so say we go back to our health record example, right? You're trying to get the health records. What you would probably do from there is you would go and find out what real world advanced persistent threat actors have targeted um, health companies, right? Have t targeted um, health organizations, hospitals and stuff like that, right? And you're going to then see like, okay, what, process did they use what kill chain we'll talk about kill chain in a second what kill chain did they use you know what tool what specific you know as granular as what specific tools did they use to successfully um conduct that attack right and you're going to emulate them as closely as possible so a lot of times you're not just emulating some generic adversary you're actually emulating a specific advanced persistent threat actor. And these are all numbered. Well, I think there should be some links somewhere, I would think here, that we can actually see um, what some specific APTs are. And But that was typically how you'd be doing it. So that's pretty important to note there. Red Team can use various cyber kill chains to summarize and assess the steps and procedures of an engagement. So the blue team commonly uses these chains as well to map the adversary's movement and, and break down what's happening basically, right? So there's a, a lot of different kill chains that you can use. And I'm, if, I just pull, if I just pull one up here, like the Lockheed Martin one, you can see it's, it's basically stuff like this. So first we got recon and weaponization, right? So recon is like harvesting email addresses, conference information, etc., and then you weaponize a payload, right? So couple an exploit with backdoor into a deliverable payload. Then you deliver that. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do this, like I was mentioning earlier. Email, web, USB, etc. And then you have the actual exploitation. You can try to exploit a vulnerability to execute code on a victim system. And install any kind of malware. And then command and control, right? So you want to link it up with your command and control so you can manage all your beacons, things like that, and manipulate them remotely. And then actions on objectives. This is where, you know, whatever your main goal was. So if you're trying to get health records, this is where you start, you know, leveraging the fact that you have code execution and the command and control in place and persistence and all that. And now you start running those commands to grab that health, those health records or whatever your objective is, right? So this is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. There's a bunch of other ones. Some of them get really granular, like the MITRE attack framework is a very uh, well-known one. As you see, a lot more granular stuff is involved here. I could even say show sub techniques and you can see like specifically how this is breaking things down but i won't spend too much time here let's get back into uh the kill chain they have here it looks like is the lockheed martin kill chain that we just went over so basically the steps that I was reading off earlier, and they actually explain what these different things are, and they give some examples, which is pretty cool. Um, the Lockheed Martin one did as well. but So for the recon, you're just trying to obtain as much information as you can on the target. Um, harvesting emails and OSINT is mostly what you're talking about in a red team engagement rather than a pen tester. When we think of recon, we normally think of you know, just gaining as much information as we can on the technology. We're more focused on people and processes as red teamers, like I said. So 
we're going to try to get emails that we can then later use in our phishing attacks, right? Maybe some OSINT to get information on specific employees, figure out what their interests are. If we want to do a spear phishing attack, a targeted phishing attack, right? Or something like that. And, um, yeah, so OSINT really comes into play a lot more for, for red team than it would uh, for a pen tester. And then weaponization would be next, right? So combine the objective with an exploit. So these are all the things we, we covered these earlier, but you see here there's some examples on the side. So if an adversary deployed Mimi Cats on a target machine, where would they be placed in the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain? Well, they would install, you know, if they deployed that on the machine, they'd install it. So that would be installation. So we'll go there. And then what techniques purpose is to exploit the target's system to execute code? That would be exploitation, as you see here. And now we'll go into the overview of a red team engagement next. So all the things we have discussed come together when performing a red team engagement to better understand how the components and stakeholders interact. We will analyze a simple engagement example. So we'll click, it looks like we need to click this. And I, I guess we're going to get a flag at the end, it looks like. So let's see what this is here. Oh, this is pretty neat. I haven't actually seen this in any of the, uh, in the rooms. So red team engagements, red and white teams define the goal of the exercise. So, okay, they're going to present us with a scenario here. And their goal is to access the transactional database of the bank. So they're testing a banking organization, right? A bank, basically. So white and red teams will define goals that align with the business's risk scenarios. So this is, th this is how this benefits the organization, right? Each business is uniquely going to have its own risks, right? Obviously, if they're a bank, one clear threat is that someone... You know, an, an attacker and an APT actor or what have you might try to access their the bank transactions or bank records, right? So the point of having, you know, red team and, and blue team in, in this scenario is to make sure that they are prepared to deal with that type of threat, right? So that is the value that you provide as a red team or as a red teamer or as a blue teamer in this scenario, right? So blue team is not usually informed at this stage about the exercise as we want to analyze their natural response against the attacker. Yeah, this is what we were talking about earlier. And so at the very beginning, the red team is going to gather intel on the bank, plan a strategy based on TTPs, remember tactics and, and all that, right? So also um, they're going to... Okay, yeah, like I said, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier is they're going to choose which one to emulate based on the real APTs that targeted similar institutions. So they're going to look at things like the technologies in use, the a list of employees. So this is talking about the technology that their target uses, right? And a list of employees, information on social media, photos, any other usable information. And then threat intelligence sources are also used to check for APTs. Yeah, so if you look at this here, Carbonac, this is one of the sites that you can reference for this. And you can see a bunch of different APTs here. These are all in the name of a different advanced per uh, persistent threat actor. So if I just choose one like um, Muddy Water, let's see. Iranian threat group has primarily targeted Middle Eastern nations. So probably this is one you, you wouldn't use unless you were targeting, if you were working for like the government in like a Middle East country then perhaps, right? You know, oil rig, probably attacking oil rigs and stuff. So, yeah, you, you get it here kind of, right? Um, Lazarus Group. So, yeah, and another thing is like when you drill down, right, you can also see techniques used. So these are the techniques that they have traditionally used. So you can emulate their techniques as well, and you can see their tools um, in software here, right? So these are the actual tools that they were using. So 
So they actually use WannaCry. See, a lot of times they use um, ransomware and stuff like that, as you see here. And you got a bunch of other references, but yeah, you could do this for all the different APTs and definitely something cool to check out in your free time. Uh, if you guys want to want to look at this, this is on the MITRE, Attack MITRE site. But let's see here. With all the information at hand, the red team will create a plan that includes several TTPs that fit the target and get approved by the white team. So yeah, um, they're gonna have a, a bunch of tactics from these threat actors that they're gonna, you know, plan to implement depending on their situation, right? So in the beginning, phishing emails is, you know, a very common way to get in. There's also USB drops and things like that. If you're doing physical, a physical engagement where you're actually on site, um. So you can start with that. And a lot of times, you know, hopefully your blue team is going to detect that there's a phishing campaign going on against your organization and send out an email, a phishing alert. But that's going to, that's definitely going to save a lot of people from clicking on it. But every time there's going to be at least one person that has already opened it by the time the alert even gets sent out, right? Because the blue team has to react to this because they don't know what's coming, right? They don't know what our what our goals are as red teamers uh, they have to detect us live so they're always going to be one step behind us in this stage of the engagement right and pretty much throughout the engagement that's why it's called incident response and, and detection and stuff like that right but uh yeah so this this isn't gonna prevent us from gaining access as red teamers but yeah they need to be sending out alerts and things like that You'll see that at this stage. And then once we gain our initial access through that phishing, um, we're definitely going to be dealing with antivirus. So we're going to need to apply some evasion techniques, which it's really not a problem, right? Because all, all antivirus can be bypassed. It's just a matter of um, having those techniques on hand to do so. And even coming up with your own custom ways to bypass stuff. That's a, that's a whole nother skill, but it's, it's definitely, if you're going to be a red teamer, it's, it's one that's uh, critical for sure. But yeah, so it's possible. So using these techniques is possible to cloak a known local exploit to gain system account privileges without being detected by dumping local accounts, a password hash for a local admin backups was obtained. The hash couldn't be cracked. So, here you go. You see them using Mimi Cats here doing a Sam dump, and dumping the Sam, getting all the all the uh, hashes for past the hash attack because you have the NTLM hash here for for these accounts. So they couldn't crack the password, but that doesn't really matter because they can just pass the hash. So that's the thing about at Windows and Active Directory. Uh, we won't talk too much about Active Directory in this video. But yeah, just know that for Windows, if you get the NTLM hash, you can use that to authenticate. You don't need to crack it to get the password. Of course, if you do, then even better, right? And you can crack it offline. So while you're cracking it, there's no chance of detection because um, you're doing that locally. Uh, so Red Team found a missing Windows patch, uh, missing Windows patches on Bob PC. One of them allowed for the print nightmare exploitation, which is a really cool privilege escalation um, exploit you can do if it's not patched. This came out pretty recently, like within the last years, within the last year. So go ahead and look into this if you're not familiar, but, um, while available public exploit was detected by many AV solutions, some AV evasion techniques were successfully applied to avoid trigger triggering any alarms and obtaining system privileges. The red team was able to upload a modified Mimi Cats to extract local password hashes, including the local administrator account backup. So yeah, we have access now to the backups account. We've compromised that account. And yeah, so modified Mimi Cats, meaning that, you know, obviously the regular Mimi Cats will be flagged by antivirus, but we just change a few things and we bypass it. 
So now from this point, we want to use those credentials for lateral movement, see what where that has access, that backups account, probably quite a bit of places if it's a backups account. Um, one of the best accounts you can get for sure because usually they have some elevated privileges as well. So there's some suspicious log traffic that's generated from these login attempts because remember, every action we do, not even as an attacker, but as a user, every action we do is logged, you know, should be, right? Um, at least all the big actions like attempting logins and, and things like that. So, a direct connection from Bob PC to the database was blocked by the firewall. Using the pass the hash, it was possible to connect to DBA PC using backups, users, password hash, using credentials found on a text file, on DBA PC's desktop, it was possible to access the DB. Very common. This is an extremely common scenario. And so, you know, you might have access, you know, you might identify like a, a database or something like that. It's probably blocked by a firewall, but obviously some people need access to it, like database administrators, DBAs, right? So they probably have a system that they're using, a, a, maybe a jump server or something like that that um, is on the other side of that firewall. So it's very common um, in IT environments to find jump servers that are, you know, or maybe even in this case, a specific jump server that is only used to access the database, right? Or maybe it's used to access a whole other environment that's segregated from the rest of the network, from the other network by a firewall. So, and there you go. Uh, it has access to the DBA PC. And then from there, there's a text file. So another very common scenario, a lot of times the data is not being encrypted at rest, right? And you can just go in and see plain text uh, credentials. Um, as well, If even if it's being encrypted, as long as, um, as long as the code to decrypt it on there exists, then you can then just decrypt it and obtain it that way. Or if it is hashed, if you can crack the hash. So there's many ways to obtain the passwords from here. It sounds like in this scenario, it's just on a text file, hard-coded. Also, very, very common. Like, extreme, you'd be surprised how common this is. So in the end, red, white, and blue teams will check together how security controls are improved in order to be ready for a real threat. Um... After finishing this exercise, red, white, and blue teams will meet to discuss about how to improve the security of the bank. So, yep, this is all post-engagement. And so, although we are focusing on the specific TTPs that allow the red team to reach its objective, in a real-life engagement, you usually have failed attempts as well. Definitely, right? I think we all know that here as pen testers, right? Many failed attempts. But for red teamers specifically, they only need that one successful attempt, all right? It is important to note that those failed attempts can still provide valid information for the exercise. Suppose, for example, that you ran some brute force attacks against the DB server and never got any valid credentials from it. It might still be interesting to check if the blue team detected the attack at the end of the engagement. Yeah, because that will help you um, improve. So also remember that many things might take unexpected turns during the engagement. Maintaining clear communication between the red and white teams is vital to make decisions that will direct the exercise in the right course and avoid conflicts at the end of the road. Awesome. So now we can just use this flag here to answer that question. So... Yeah, notice how the cyber kill chain naturally aligns with this exercise. Start with recon, gather as much intel as we can about the target, followed by weaponization delivery by sending a phishing email with a malicious attachment, continued by exploitation and installation phases when local exploits, when using local exploits to elevate privileges on Bob PC, and then installing tools on a compromised host to dump password hashes and perform lateral movement. To finish with actions and objectives where a connection to our target is finally made. So that is like the overall process and a really nice real world example of what this might look like. So conclusion, 
A simplified overview of, of red team engagements has provide, has been provided in this room. The main concepts, components, and stakeholders have been introduced to gain a first understanding of such exercises in the rooms that follow. So yeah, it looks like there's more, so that's pretty cool. Maybe we'll take a look at the future rooms if there's an interest, right? I want to make content that you guys want to watch, so let me know in the comment section if you're interested in seeing any of these follow-up ones, I would imagine that they're going to get more in-depth with actual the actual red team engagements itself. This one was like a high-level overview, I would say. So, yeah, if there's interest in that, I'll make videos on it. Let me know down in the comments section below. And if you want to keep learning and keep getting hands-on with stuff, check out the technical content that I have on screen right now. I'll see you guys right over in those videos. Thanks for watching.